Today you are here for are you the I in CII or as the sign says also who are the I in the CII? So please keep both eyes open in your CII tonight. And it's a discussion, a briefing and a discussion we're going to have for the public consultation on the draft cybersecurity bill for Singapore. And this is the the bill is what it is before it becomes an act. We are at the stage now of draft. It has not even been put before the parliament. It is actually being put before the public first. This is not a very common thing. It's actually a very good opportunity for us to give feedback before it even reaches parliament for the first time. So please do give as much input as you can. Until the speakers have all finished, before you give your input and feedback, you might be very keen to give some input or feedback, but please write it down. Or put it in your phone or commit it to memory so that we can discuss it at the end when the panel is totally seated. My name is Benjamin Ang. I'm the program chair of the Internet Society Singapore chapter. That's the thing in the right corner. And you can download the draft of the bill and the public consultation paper from our website of the Internet Society Singapore chapter, www.isoc.sg. And of course, you are wondering, even if you're not wondering, I'll tell you. Who is the Internet Society? We are part of the international non-profit organization whose mission it is to promote the open development, evolution, and use of the internet for the benefit of all people throughout the world. That includes you and me. And if you're a member, you help to change the world. Because we have 90 plus chapters worldwide, 50,000 individual members, 140 organization members, and it gives a powerful voice. In some countries, it is a voice to set up infrastructure, to provide internet to all people. In some countries, it's a voice for advocacy and lobbying. In some countries like ours, it's a voice for public consultation. So for example, we did a round table on the Copyright Act, and we gave our input on the changes to the Copyright Act. We also work internationally. We have regional inter-community video calls on building trust on the internet, where we video call with the other chapters around Asia. We've also taken steps where we found that a, for example, a law firm was, that represented the owners of the particular movie, Dallas Buyers Club, was threatening users. We actually made a complaint to the Law Society and that was taken into account by the Attorney General. And generally, we build awareness through workshops and networking. So, if you're interested in getting involved, you could... You could... Join the Singapore chapter or attend an event or join our mailing list. Go to www.isop.sg. So after this word from our sponsor, and we also want to thank NTUC for letting us use this venue. You're welcome. Yes. Thank you. Housekeeping rules. This is being recorded on video. The recordings of the speakers and of the presentations. And the recording will be available on our website, www.isoc.sg. Please keep your questions to the end after all the speakers have completed. And we will do our best not to take so long. We want to give you time. So let's start with part one of the Cyber Security Bill. And part one is definitions. So I will do my best not to put entire chunks of legislation on the screen, which is a terrible, terrible thing that lawyers like to do. Definition first. So I summarized it, right? Uh, this, you're going to see the word computer system a lot. And the computer system involves an arrangement of interconnected computers. Computers that are connected together. ICS, SCADA, DCS are specifically mentioned there. And computer itself, the word is the same wide definition as the computer we use. Right? So this is a computer, this is a computer, this thumb drive could be a computer as well. There's also use of the word cybersecurity incidents and threats. So an incident is an act or activity that has jeopardized or adversely impacted without lawful authority, security, availability, or integrity of a computer or computer system. So you remember computer, computer system defined already? Now it's an incident that adversely affects roughly the C, I, and A that we know so well. The confidentiality, integrity, and availability. 
right? Then a threat. A threat is when the incident is going to happen. So incident means happen, threat means it's going to happen. Or suspected to go to happen. And the last important definition, critical information infrastructure, TI. A computer or computer system that is necessary for the continuous delivery of essential services, which Singapore relies on. You can see the first schedule. The first schedule is at the back. It's like an appendix. It gives you a whole list of essential services that Singapore has. If you want to take note of it, it's the computer or systems which are necessary. It's not the business. It's the computers that are necessary for the essential services, not necessarily the business. And um, also, you know, if it's the loss of compromise, will affect national security defense. You know, basically, if it's an essential service, it will affect all of these. Okay? But the key thing, it is the computers upon which the essential services rely on. And if you think about it, there are many computers or computer systems which are not in the necessarily in the same building or in the same business organization as the essential service itself because we have very complex supply chains. So if you are providing a computer to one of these essential services, you are providing a critical information infrastructure. I'll let that sit in for about two seconds. Okay. Part two is the administration. And this is the appointment of the cybersecurity commissioner and the officers. So this one is, is really administrative. No issue with it. You can go and read it. Part three is critical information infrastructure. So having defined what is critical information infrastructure, which is a computer or computer systems which is essential to essential services. First thing is section eight. Before you are designated a CII, the commissioner of cybersecurity has the power to obtain information to find out whether you should be a CII or not. So if you haven't been called yet, you could be called to provide information to see if you fit the criteria of CII. Section 10 then establishes if you have been given that notice, that letter that says that you are a CII, congratulations, you now have certain duties. First one, to provide info to CSA. Second one, to comply with codes or standards which are set up. Third one, notify CSA of incidents or threats. Fourth one, conduct regular audits. Fifth one, conduct regular risk assessments. Sixth one, participate in cybersecurity exercises. Okay, so these are your duties. And then section 11, what is the information that you need? under the first duty in the previous slide. Well, technical information of the CII can be design and configuration of your CII, design and configuration for interconnected computers that are connected to your CII computer system. You can see this is getting wider. Info on any other computer system that is interconnected. It's a fine line between B and C, but you can see this has a wide potential, that if you're a CII owner, you need information on all of these. And if you happen to be one of the computers, if you happen to own one of the computers that are interconnected in some way to a CII, the CII owner is probably going to want information from you and any other information which is necessary. From a lawyer point of view, this excellent drafting, basically, um, the part D means any other thing that I have missed out. I will end later. <laughs> Section 13 is the power to issue directions. So, if the commissioner finds it necessary for securing the CII, well, actually, you're going to see the second reason, or for the effective administration of the Act, which is a bit less onerous, then the commissioner can issue a direction. And this direction could tell you to do any of the three A's. First one is take action. Second one is to do an audit. And the third one is any other thing. 
again, very well written in terms of flexibility. So let's say something has happened. Section 15 puts the CII owner in a duty to report the incident. And you need to report significant events or events on any internet connected computer or any other incident. So in order to do this, it is specified that if you're a CIA owner, you need to set up threat detection, some method or process to be able otherwise, how do you know that something has happened? Fortunately, no time period is specified. As we know, the average the time to detection in Asia is 500 days. So, this is your duty to report the incident. Now, besides reporting, we now also have to deal with responding to and preventing cybersecurity incidents. And that brings us to part four. Because we know it always looks like this. How are you supposed to respond? Don't worry, the powers are given to the commissioner in three different situations. First situation, Jackson, section 20, normal cyber security incident. I've seen the traffic light. I think you're, if you run a song, I hope this is a useful analogy. There's powers to investigate and prevent cyber security incidents, meaning to take information, to get statements. Section 21 is the second category, serious cyber security incidents. There are more powers here. Powers like the power to seize computers, the power to enter premises. These are powers which will be will have more impact on your operations. And these should only be triggered if one of these criteria is met. There's a real risk of harm to the CII, or there's a real risk of disruption to the essential service. You notice that the it's the disruption to the service, not harm to the business, harm to the computer. So it's, it's wider than that. Or a real threat to national security or foreign relations or economy, which requires some imagination, but we can figure out. Or something which is severe because of the number of computers or value of information, which is interesting because if, let's say, 10,000 computers were hit by a botnet, that could be severe enough to trigger Section 21. So this is your mid-level seriousness. The most serious one is red light, emergency cybersecurity measures. When it hits this emergency level, then the minister, uh, which the minister will determine, then the minister can direct anyone to take such measures to comply with such yada yada, which basically means the minister can direct anybody to do anything. So that is when an emergency is imminent. Now, part five is the one which got a lot of people very excited because it's the licensing of cybersecurity service providers. This actually addressed a question where how do we know who is a legitimate cybersecurity service provider? Now that everybody's getting suddenly aware of cybersecurity as a need, you know that whenever a need arises, you know there are people who will rise up to fill their need, including a lot of people who actually don't know what they're doing, but will happily take money to do it. So how do we know whether they are real or they are fake news? Well, they need to be licensed. If you're running an investigative cybersecurity service, and they say investigative means something which involves circumventing of controls, or obtaining a deep level of access to test defenses. The easiest thing to think of would be pen testing. But you could probably think of some other examples. Because examples are assessing, forensics, forensics is also investigative, scanning, thorough examination. So if you're doing any of these, you need a license. There's also non-investigative cybersecurity service. Now this is really much wider. If you are designing, selling, importing, exporting, installing, maintaining, repairing, servicing, that's, you need a license. If you're providing advice, so I must be careful who I give advice to, on products or strategies or practices, 
or providing training or instruction, in which case, standing up here in front of you, I am now licensable. So, a license is required, otherwise it's an offence to practice in this field, and if you employ somebody to provide this service without a license, you're also committing an offence. So these are roughly some of the key areas. Please do take time to read the whole draft bill for yourself. I've just highlighted a few things. Um, your feedback is important. Okay? So you can get these slides and the recording later from myself.sg. But now I hand you over to the president of the Internet Science Singapore chapter and the partner at the law firm of Pinson Mason, Billy, Brian Tan. Uh, and the interesting statistic that we have, so I think we've done this for four years, um, and in all four years, cybersecurity was one of the top concerns, the top policy concern uh, in the in, in Asia Pacific. In 2017, uh, it's now become the top policy concern. Okay, so it's the top policy concern uh, throughout the Asia Pacific. Uh, no guesses why. Uh, the incidences are becoming more frequent, the incidences are becoming more severe. Um, for all the internet users, the main thing that they are now worried with uh, is cyber security. Uh, and I think the boardrooms are also going to be concerned about it. Um, and so for those who are locals, I think boardrooms are going to have two new people introduced into it. Uh, one is Mr. Hing and one is Mr. Xiao. <laughs> because as we go through this, some people are gonna say, Oh hey. And some other people are gonna say, Oh Xiao. Okay? Uh, and if you look at this closer, I'm going to suggest some boardrooms are going to say both. Okay, why? Uh, so as Benjamin has mentioned, you know, this big thing, critical information infrastructure. Uh, and there's some definitions we talked about already. Uh, and that's going to be here. What I'm going to suggest is, even if you don't have critical information infrastructure, there's going to be some part that are going to be applicable to you. Okay, and that's where all the people who just said hey, I'm going to say Xiao. And we'll look at this in detail. Um, so management needs to really look out at this. Now, what's going to happen in this whole process uh, on, the, on the red part of the screen, right? So we looked at uh, that definition already about critical information infrastructure, essential services relating to what's in your first schedule. And what's going to happen is that if you have critical information infrastructure wholly or partly in Singapore, okay, it fulfills the criteria of critical information infrastructure, you then get a notice by the government. Okay, so again, all the hints and Xiao's are going to come up and they'll say, wow, hey, you know, we are nowhere in Singapore doesn't cover us. Okay, for the moment, until we get uh, later on. Uh, hey, uh, we never got a notice, so we don't have to bother about this. We'll look at it later. Uh, and if you do get this notice, the notice lasts for five years, unless it's withdrawn. Okay, so for the next five years, if you receive one of these notices, sorry, the rest of the stuff is going to be very applicable to you. Uh, we talked about essential services. Uh, this is only the headers from the first schedule. Okay, so there's a lot more detail in there. Uh, so for instance, for instance, my favorite one is this one, services relating to media. Okay, so when we think about this, what do we think about? Oh, we think about newspapers, we think about uh, you know, social media, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, election printing is considered a service relating to media. Printing of election coupons. Uh, it somehow falls under that. Uh, and why, okay, you know now we can kind of imagine why if something happens to the election printing process, that would be quite disastrous. Okay, but, uh, so look into the, the, the details, as they say, the devil is in details. So look into the details because, uh, you know, that's where your aim might become Xiao. Okay? Um, and it's all there. Now, the next thing I'll tell you is, uh, those notices will be sent to what they call the owner of critical information infrastructure. Okay, and I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, so I like to put up the whole definition. Uh, and if you look at the whole definition, it means that someone who has effective control over the operations 
of the critical information infrastructure or is responsible for ensuring the continuous functioning uh, of the critical information infrastructure. So it might mean that even though you're not in strictly this business, okay, so you can't take the view, I'm not in any of these businesses, clear. No, you could be the person that's providing the, if, um, the infrastructure for that business. You could be an outsource service provider to that business and you're going to be considered an owner of a critical information infrastructure. Okay, so all, all the Mr. Seals have now appeared already. Let's go on. Uh, so what's going to happen if you are an owner of um, critical information infrastructure? Uh, as Ben mentioned, provide technical information, we've talked about that. Comply with issues, codes of practice and directions. The important thing to remember is, currently there are no codes of practice or directions. Okay, so you've been signed up to something, you've got this notice. Along the way, they said, okay, you now have a code of practice. Comply. And you'll be scrambling to comply that for something that you don't know at this point in time when you are made to comply with that. Same with directions. Uh, you do have to notify uh, cyber security incidents. Uh, Ben's right, there is no uh, deadline timing uh, for you to make that notification. Uh, but just so that you all are feeling happy about the bit of this, yesterday uh, the PDPC announced mandatory breach notification. You have 72 hours to notify uh, uh, breaches if they happen, uh, which are significant. Okay, so there you have your timeline already set for you. Uh, regular audits once every three years uh, and regular risk assessment, separate exercise once every three years. Uh, oh, you get to participate in uh, required cyber security exercises. Okay, so you have a nationwide exercise, you are a CII owner, uh, you get to participate in that. Uh, plus, if there's a change in ownership, uh, you have to inform the regulator. So somebody else now gets to hold the, the you know, carry the, uh, hold the baby. Uh, you have, you know, that person then acquires all your obligations. Okay, so they're going to make sure that you're going to do that. Ah, okay. So the guys in blue. So, so far, it doesn't sound like it's me. I've not gotten the notice. I don't have anything down the road. Oh, wait, hang on. Uh, just so we're there. So I, I'm going to give you an example. Uh, so let's say you're a small Singapore company. Okay, you're so small that you only have one customer. And in your mind, there's no way that you could be covered because all they're doing is you run a, a building control system that uh, helps secure one room in one building, one single customer. And you think that this particular customer does nothing but store some uh, paint. Okay. Turns out, this is the guy who supplies the paint for those election printing people. So I think you just have <laughs> critical information in this Okay, so if it doesn't, if you don't think it applies to you, look, it looks like a remote possibility, uh, you might have to think again. Alright? Okay, so just in case you are clear that it doesn't apply to you, and you are in the blue part, non-critical information, uh, infrastructure information, information infrastructure rather, um, I think you've got to think again. The obligations in part 4 that Ben talk, uh, talked about, uh, the section 20, 21, and 22, uh, different levels of uh, cyber security incidents, right? We talked about that. That applies to any person. To any person. So, all that talk about uh, owner of critical information infrastructure, that's for people who got the notices. This one, when something like that happens, uh, they can then activate these powers and it applies to anyone. So, th that whole discussion about critical information infrastructure is passed already. This one, anyone. Uh, it also suggests that the uh, holding or partly in Singapore test uh, doesn't quite apply here. Okay, so it could be wholly not in Singapore, but you are in Singapore. Okay. Uh, and as Ben suggested, it escalates. So uh, when it's just a normal cyber security incident, uh, you're only subject to investigation. You start monitoring, they can ask you to start scanning, uh, they can ask you to install.
Um, so let's start with um, Benjamin Tan. Hey ben, um, you serve a wide number of uh, different customers in your business, right? Uh, and you've seen those 11 areas of uh, essential services. Do you think that's too wide, too narrow? Uh, are we looking at the right things or the wrong things there? Uh, the mic. Yes, the mic. Yeah, okay. Hi, 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 yes, no, yes, okay, um, it's definitely too wide, right, it's definitely too wide, I don't think anybody would say it's too narrow, but uh, my primary issue with this whole potential legislation is the overreach of the, overreach of the entire thing, um, I hope I'm not, I, I welcome you to stop me if you think I'm going too far off on the tangent, but I, I'd like to hit some cursory issues which I don't think were entirely brought up just now, of course, feeling no offense to either of you, but a uh, slightly different angle a, a little bit on that. We've talked quite a bit about the actual provisions and what you can be made to do and how, but if we move one step back at the meta level of the whole act, this legislation is very interesting in that its overreaching, overarching powers are all centered back on this matter of trust. It's no longer a rule of law, it's a rule of trust. There's no point saying that, oh, all these powers will never be used or you have to trust on. Then there's no longer a rule of law. Right? You, 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 have, you, you cannot dispense with the fact that these items are overreaching and just having to rely on the trustworthiness of the administrators, of those whose powers has been on. And I would add to that that it also, as a, as a quick follow-up, doesn't... It, it doesn't befit the whole discussion if you say, but there are other acts in Singapore that are also drafted this way. Because this is the one up for public consultation now. Do we want one more of these? Do we want one more of these? And I will, uh, I think somebody's going to jump in and hammer me soon. But, um, the, and specifically, uh, two points, two specific points that I'd like to make. One, if you read the comments, if you read the um, a public consult document, it says that whether or not a system is going to be a CII is a matter of the OSA. It's an official secret. That is on point 20, uh, 28, if you missed it. I think that's a bloody sneaky thing. 28 says that the designation of a computer or computer system as a CII is an official secret under the OSA. So I assume they're going to put that into the schedule. That's how things are usually done. Just modify the schedule of the OSA and then systems in. So now if it's an OSA, official secret, well official secret, I'll drop the A, then how are you going to object? How are you going to say anything to anybody that you've been asked to do this or been asked to do that? You can't even scream for help, you know, because if you scream for help, you say, hey, I've been served, you know, oh, you cannot say you've been served, because then you would have revealed that you are a CII, and that's a OSC offense. So how are we going to do that? Also, for instance, if some of that technical information is not in your control, somebody else has that, you can't go to him to say, hey, I need that information. Because I'm a CII. Because that's OSC also. So that's totally screwed. Um, further to that, also, there's something which maybe the... The, the lawyers with the practicing cert here can explain rather than me. Um, that the effect, you, you might want to explain to, to, to everyone, lest I, I, I explain in the wrong way, but based on what I still remember from drafting and elements. Um, section 12, uh, section 12, 5, sub 5. Any code or practice standard of performance issued or approved by the commissioner under this section does not have legislative effect. Of course, as I say again, it's the way everything else is drafted in Singapore. But the point being, does not have legislative effect. 
Doesn't mean you don't need to obey it. It means it cannot be reviewed by Parliament. Because it's not subsidiary legislation. And if you bring it up as an administrative review, anyway it complies with the Act, because the, that's what the Act, well, by the time it becomes an Act, Act gives Minister absolute discretion, so there's nothing for the courts to review anyway, because it's, it's in compliance with the Act, because the Act says, like, you've got discretion. So there's no review at all. And coming back to the subject of review, when you look at the Commissioner and, and the whole thing about the, the appeals and all that, nothing tells you who is going to be part of this review committee. Because by the way this thing is drafted, it seems to be all wisdom with regard to cybersecurity vests in the CSA. Therefore, if the CSA, a commissioner, chief executive will be the commissioner, commissioner asks you to do something and you want to appeal to the minister, who is the minister, which secret ministerial committee <coughs> is going to be assembled in order to review that decision? No, no, no. <laughs> I haven't even started on the machinations yet. Okay. So okay, quite a sort of history. Uh, yeah, Ben. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think that was a very good report. Yeah, and I think that so definitely one of the one of the feedback we should give is it should not be under OSA. So that's one. Because it will prevent CI owners from getting the information that they need from suppliers. So that's a good point. And also uh, point of judicial review or administrative review of the designation as a CI should also be put in, which is clearer and which should be clarified because the review committee itself, we should suggest who should be on the review. Any suggestions for who should be on the review committee? Whatever it is, it cannot be CSA people or anybody who's the, who is a subordinate of the commissioner. Right? I think it doesn't make sense to have a Enquiry and, and a, a session in, for example, Parliament where you have your subordinates hearing you, right? It doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just saying hypothetically, or, or of course, you know. It's like, so let's yes. uh, suggest that instead a, a cross industry, industry, I, I would say group. industry group, okay. even though they may not be computer security people per se per se it should be members of the industry to to, to review and internet society should send somebody you're the you're the eyesaw if anybody else also has uh, ideas of who should be on the review committee right? that's what i it, had suggested industry draw from industry, industry yeah, yeah. Okay. draw from industry, industry. draw from the academics draw from academics, academics. yeah so for people industry academics in the yeah, a public, private, and academic position. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. people in academics so like the like the you know mm -hmm. dean of big um, one policy. You know, so they might might have something to sure. say about things like that. You know, yeah. And, and then it's like the um, <laughs> so the, and the same thing for the courts of practice as well. So all yes. there should be yeah. to be a cross you cross that. Yes. So effectively, because not. That shall not have legislative effect. Minister's decision shall be final. And as I say again, so I, I, if I'm repeating myself, but I, I feel it's an important point. We cannot just dispense with this and say, but all other acts also adopted like that. Some of you are well aware. Well, this is up for review now. They want comments and we are giving our comments. That's good. So, so, right? so we will uh, dispense with the fact that other acts are also adopted like that. that that's besides that's the point. Beyond our, uh, yeah, that, that's besides the point. I mean, so, so we should also not hold ourselves back just because other acts are drafted this way. And by the way, a lot of acts are drafted this way. Okay, so question for uh, AP. Um, the oh, okay. I, 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 a related point? Yeah. Audio point? Uh, microphone for microphone. Point. Microphone. Okay, I think I'll just shut it off. I, I think uh, one of the points for the recording we need to add. Sorry? Easier for that for so, recording so you can hear Thank it. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add one point about the OSA contention. Um, I think asking for the technical information of your supplier chain would not actually be something that you need to express that I'm under OSA because it's contractual obligation. Yes, there might be a case where today my contracts don't provide for that, but subsequent renewals may actually allow you to sort it in. Does that increase your cost of contracts? Naturally so. But uh, I do see that there are ways that you can get that information without having to say that, oh, because I'm under OSA, I'm in a dilemma situation. 
Yeah. So there's a, if you put it at some length, the difficulties where uh, people who assume that they are not going to be CIOI uh, getting themselves scheduled. Uh, what happens if I'm a CIOI owner? I am not cleared, and yet I am, strictly speaking, the other separate uh, OSA. How does that work? Sorry. Uh, as I understand it, um, I'm going to this with telcos here. Um, I could have done it, but I haven't done it to go through the G15 process. Um, in order to be in a position where I can deal with information that's subject to the OSA, the general picture, as I understand it, is if you are not cleared, then you can't. What happens if you're not cleared and you get scheduled? How does that say work with people who do not have any permits? Because we're no longer talking about a situation where Singapore Inc. owns the asset. We're talking about ancillary assets that are smaller than other businesses that suddenly get themselves scheduled, whatever the word is, designated. Oh, and then are now sort of bound by OSA but have no personnel. Who are clear to handle all the business. Oh, I think the concern was more was more that you would not be able to tell anybody that you are a CII. That's the only thing that you are under restriction. You cannot tell other people that you are a CII. Everything else should go on as normal. But which other people cannot tell? Anybody who might be a Anybody. Not Anybody. under the voice. My point? How can I, I comply with the yeah, I believe. I don't understand how the OSA works with private sector. To be clear, uh, 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 no. and so let's say somebody wants to come and buy your company up. Uh, I don't know how you're going to tell them that once you buy as a. On the one hand, I must give them ninety days numbers yeah. because the act requires it. On the other hand, I'm allowed to tell them. Yeah. <laughs> Can't both be true. <laughs> Sorry, that, that was the. So, yeah. so, so, so definitely, there's some right difficulties now. there. Um, some of that can be ameliorated by uh, contracts, um, but perhaps also after some time people know, look, you know, this guy's asking me all these kinds of questions, and I know why he's asking that right here. Um, so, but that's something to think about. Uh, I've got a question for, for Indy. Um, this requirement that your CII needs to be wholly or partly in Singapore, uh, my question is that, is that realistic? Is it realistic to always assume that your infrastructure is you know, physically somewhere within Singapore? Will there be situations where some of the CII might be actually outside of Singapore? That's um, a very relevant point that you brought about, Brian. Um, let's be realistic about how IT infrastructure happens in Singapore and in the context of um, this particular act, if you look at Singapore, it's a hosting hub for the region. Now, let's say you have and a lot of that information, whether it resides in data centers, whether it uh, resides on cloud computing services, uh, what are popularly called infrastructure as a service, um, is basically virtualized servers where um, the location may not be certain. It could be co-located with other machines. Um, what happens to Singapore's position as a hosting hub? If a physical asset is can be accessed by the Singapore government, where uh, companies, corporations, look, you know, where Singapore is the Asian headquarters, and those are seized within the data center, or anyone can access them. What happens to the confidentiality provisions um, that these companies are placing in Singapore and what does it do to Singapore's competitive advantage? Has this been thought through? Um, so this is a reality of today's virtualized uh, infrastructure or the cloud computing environment. What happens? I, sorry, wait a minute. I've got a question. Um, what happens um, uh, in terms of once one once a physical, you know, whether it's a device, a computer system, your mobile has been accessed because your critical infrastructure. What happens to the other uh, 
information that you already have there. What so there are questions from a data privacy perspective. There are questions from a Singapore's competitive advantage perspective um, that need to be thought through as a um, what happens in certain sectors, let's say the maritime sector. We have international agreements for sharing of information. Oh, to what extent can, say, a maritime operator, which is, comes now under the OSA, which information um, can they share? without uh, getting a notification. So the, these elements where Singapore's international commitments could come in the way of the implementation of the law, uh, where the two laws act against each other. Example is uh, a MARPOL or a SOLAS convention of safety of life at sea, where you're required to uh, give certain information about lives, individuals, uh, of people, of containerized cargo, for instance, the manifest, um, some of this information. What happens? Uh, so the extent and scope, if you look into each industry, needs to be thought through. And obviously, one has to look at multiple factors uh, so that it doesn't, like uh, you talked about the fact that contracts have to be renegotiated. If the cost of hosting in Singapore uh, for a lot of these data centers, they have to be recontracted at a higher price because you've got to include higher provisions for penetration uh, testing. What happens to Singapore's competitiveness as a hosting hub? These these kind of questions also come to mind. Thank you, sir. So in a similar line, um, your sort of entry question was about CI being partially in Singapore, therefore, this will be partially not in Singapore. Uh, my concern relates to uh, information that is in or is accessible by persons or computers within Singapore with respect to the investigative powers. So, take uh, data processing that unequivocally is in no way part of Singapore CI. Um, it's not we do this sort of organizational level analysis, we do it for corporate and government customers all over the world. The way the act is written, the if a the general academy officer can give the investigative uh, orders, I forget how that's bounded, gives an instruction, even a mistaken instruction, based upon false or uh, confused information, to disclose documents in my possession without limit as to location. It's not documents located in Singapore. It's documents in my possession, which can be anywhere on the planet. Then, to resist this in any way at all is an offence. At the very least, for any company in Singapore that operates as a data processor on behalf of customers elsewhere, the smallest possible thing we would need is the right to seek judicial review of the reasonable necessity. Where the test is reasonable, and because it's the actual work, we would at the very least need Digital review. If we don't get that, and we start doing really getting at least our operations staff, possibly our organization, our directors, because it's the same problem. We, we can't say to our customers unequivocally, we will put every such request in front of the judge, because the way the act is written, we can't do that. We can't even ask to do it. So I'd be, I have two questions for those who have much better understanding of this stuff. Uh, one is, and you mentioned how other acts are drafted. Um, give or take what's perhaps reasonable for people residing in Singapore. When we are custodians of data on, on behalf of organizations who aren't in Singapore, it would seem self-evident that different rules have to apply if Singapore wishes to maintain the ability to be a data hosting center for the region. And, and therefore, <laughs> is, is this at all sensible? And then the other is council. Uh, the is access to council. It, by the look of the literal, my literal and uneducated interpretation of the act, if one of our ops guys had a guy walk in the door who claimed to be an empowered investigator under this act, present my detailed and command information, he couldn't even call a lawyer if they were going to do so without committing an offence. Have I understood that part of the act correctly? Is what guess my first question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if the act doesn't call that right, right. 
to obtain counsel before applying with more Nothing about that because it's not even subject. And if, if they say it's an OSA <coughs> issue because you have been designated as a CII, and then so even no, if you're no, not no, no, CII, no, 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 no. like it's only it's categorically yes, twenty three. So we said about the investigative powers. Once, once right. you're inside CII, twenty two, twenty three. The game changes. Yeah. But, but as long while you're outside, and both yes. systems that are categorically outside because they're not in any sense yes. like yeah. Singapore's uh, infrastructure, they're very much similar to people more outside it. Um, in that situation. At the very least, our ops guys should have access to counsel. And I, unless it's the norm to interpret that you have a right to access to counsel, no matter what the act says, unless the act says you don't, for example, this is outside my understanding law. So is, is that a. You have to appeal to the minister, they're supposed to tell you how you can appeal. There's somewhere I mean, that says. You're right to get that. Not the investigative parts, that's for designations. The investigative part is under, you see, for example, 21.5. You only commit an offence if you willfully mistake or without lawful excuse refuse to give or fail without reasonable excuse. So because these need to be defined, you would only be found to commit an offence if you have. So it does give room for you to seek advice. Are you actually doing? Because it will not be unreasonable for you to seek advice. Okay. If you, if you just say I refuse to let you in the door, uh, then that's willful refusal. But Wait, I refuse to go until I've spoken to my lawyer. Ah, that would be probably, that could arguably be reasonable. And having spoken to my lawyer, I'm now filing it for review in front of the judge. Then they have to then find, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you have actually willfully, without lawful excuse, refused. The owners will be back on the. So presumably so seeking uh, my rights in front of the court is always reasonable. Give or take that, that, that it doesn't have it, it's fully minister discretion and, and therefore I would I would I would, put that feedback and, I would put that as feedback. feedback like, uh, I, I, I mean now is the chance to put that as feedback. So that, that's that's the sort of area that, that concerns me. And um, if anyone is processing data in Singapore on behalf of overseas customers, which clearly isn't uh, uh, processing Singapore or processing elsewhere that it has control of. Because any person in Singapore yeah, probably that has control. And similarly, and I will write you later with the, the other one, um, when a computer is seized, that the investigator has the right to access information on the computer, and also that the computer has access to. And it's the same problem yeah. Yeah. with yeah. control systems that have access to yeah. computers yeah. outside Singapore, and therefore the data outside Singapore. Yeah. So that whole area is understandable, from the standpoint of maintaining a freedom of action for the investigators, but uh, nightmarish from the standpoint of to our customer when they keep dealing with us. The other comment related, and I wouldn't blame the go microphone, um, I would suggest that in the situation that these powers seem to be constructed to address, which is there is a serious incident in progress, it is seriously harming some essential part of Singapore's infrastructure. It's interfering with the ability to run the power network, so you know, the SCAR system is being attacked by, by malware that's working on one of our servers, heaven forbid. The appropriate power that I would suggest that um, the CSA have, and politely assuming that the telcos are all automatically CI, would be to, to instruct the telco to disconnect us. That's an entirely lower and less horrifying. Uh, standard of, of unreviewed interference, if there's a need to act without waiting for two or three hours or making a warrant, then the appropriate uh, power would be to go to the telco and say, cut that off. Because at that point, we're not, disclosing, that. we're not disclosing our documents that we're holding on behalf of customers to investigators without opportunity to judicial review. That was a good point. I, I think on the point of possibly cut off from the internet, sometimes we need to be real, realistic that uh, malware, for example, may not just come through the internet pathways. So it could be insider threat and all that, which is the purpose of the cybersecurity bill, as I understand. So there are so many other channels in which uh, cybersecurity incident uh, spin out from. Um, yeah, we're, we're, talk, we're talking about entry premises yeah. and having access to computers down therein. So I know you're not getting the recording. Um, without judicial review, and so that's that's specifically using. The so we're, talk, we're talking about an investigator entering premises 
and seizing computers like that area as part of addressing an incident in progress. Um, in that case, it is the telecommunication network that is the vector. Can I just jump in here? Yes. So even if it's not part of the internet, if, if you have a local loop getting out of your office that's still under control to tell them, it doesn't matter whether it's an internet access local loop or a private local loop. If uh, following the suggestion, but then if if the if we take just following on from your suggestion of cutting off, uh, telco can always cut you off. Yeah, that's one of the things but I then, enjoy about this thing. In terms of in terms of in terms of CSA powers, in terms of CSA powers, but the, the the sensible thing to have to deal with an emergent situation faster than with a court is would seem to me to be to disrupt the ability of a piece of malware to attack, which in almost all cases is going to involve the telecommunication carriers. The only exceptions are something called the general same premises as CI, in which case the next step is cut the power. And again, it's the same reasoning. It, it's stop the threat, but but treat that user mechanism to do so that does not wreck the ability of single based data processes to protect the confidentiality of their client setup. So whether it's cutting power, network cutting power, you're still left with um, the current Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi, Android malware, the, the broadband chip bug. Um, some common sense perhaps applies, pull batteries out, whatever. But, but to, yeah, the, the, the suggestion is to establish that the power is to interfere with the threat by disrupting communicational power ahead of uh, disrupting confidentiality in a way that should otherwise be uh, up, up for judicial review. Because, uh, because otherwise we can't really need customer requirements for looking out for the deal. Oh, no, never mind. Can we just uh, pick up, uh, because it dovetails nicely, just, just one, oh, one yeah, point. Yeah, and yeah, and then, um, sure, I'm oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say that while we're on this judicial review point, if we can just um, almost like recurse through the entire document again for all the points that ought to be subject, what I would recommend ought to be subject to judicial review or capable of being, including, for example, just as an example, just if I take up the rest of the, the technical experts, even appointment of cybersecurity technical experts, they can have, have more. Commissioner can appoint anybody under the sun. Can we challenge that appointment? No, this guy's not an expert. He doesn't know shit about what he's talking about. <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree he's an expert. And he's giving me sh lousy advice on what to do with it, and he's going to make matters worse by going in there. Um, something has to be part, uh, has to be subject to, to judicial review, sure. not just at absolute discretion of the, of the minister. Uh, Alan? Okay. So actually, Brian, I want to come back to your original question, which was, what if the network was 99% overseas and maybe 1% in Singapore? I mean, um, in my mind, I'm thinking about, say, a, a flight navigation ticketing system that's run out of Europe that the whole world subscribes to. And perhaps agents in Singapore access that flight reservation through an EPM of some sort for secure transmission and receiving for tax integrity. Now, with such, and, and because travel is so important to the economy of Singapore, if that goes down, it has impact. Let's pretend that somehow that is deemed as a critical interpret, uh, CII for Singapore. I don't know if it could, but it might be. Then to what extent does the authorities, the CSA in Singapore, have the right to notify this agency in Europe that you know travel is so important to Singapore that I designate you in Europe as a CII to Singapore? I think there are a lot of questions about substantiality of infrastructure in Singapore that are not that clear within the definition of um, the laws as drafted right now. Uh, so I think you're right. So again, that's something that's going to go. Uh, the gentleman said, Yeah, so coming back to the earlier um, solution like cutting off the power of telecom. Yes. Um, from the regulator's perspective, there is a huge liability exposure depending on the, the critical nature of the company where you are disturbing the whole business by cutting off whatever telecom or the power. 
the significant liability exposure on the regulators if um, uh, for the business interruption or for maybe the collapse of the company, um, reputational damage, there are lots of issues uh, which need to be obviously considered by the regulator. That's the regulator's problem. So uh, it doesn't look it doesn't look to be a practical solution. Yeah. Yes, sure. Yes. As a practicing cybersecurity professional, one of the key elements that I find, you know, uh, there's a lot of focus on location, but the reality of the situation, whether it's an airline system, a maritime system, a banking system, is that we live in what is called an era of hyper-converged infrastructure, application, and networks. And at, as networks, media, content, applications um, are increasingly centralized. Uh, we would find that uh, one is who is going to do, for example, um, the detection, who is going to do the remediation. A lot of the experts could be external to Singapore. From that perspective, the reality of the internet is that um, you could be having the infrastructure hosted in Singapore, um, a backend support personnel in one country uh, for maybe say the compute infrastructure, the storage is managed by somebody else in the third country. Um, the key management of the infrastructure or the domain managers are in a fourth or fifth or sixth country. That are where, as uh, an IT professional, there there are so many layers of any IT or critical information infrastructure. Whether you're looking at a power plant, whether you're looking at, um, for example, a ship, which is a critical element of Singapore's uh, revenue. Whether you're looking at press in terms of content, whether you're looking at a treasury feed in terms of a banking system. Across the spectrum, whichever sector you look at. Uh, if you limit your discussion to infrastructure in today's environment, you're probably not seeing the full picture. Um, from the point of view of the Act, I guess a lot of the discussion so far has focused on infrastructure. There are, let's look at all the CII, this critical information and infrastructure. From a sensitivity perspective, irrespective of what that physical infrastructure is, often the sensitivity or classification of what constitutes a threat is the data and the data with meaning that gives it that information. And this is something that uh, I'd like to refocus this discussion on. And this could be anywhere in the world. And uh, you, you'd probably need a multi-pronged and obviously in a cybersecurity world, a multi multilateral approach to solving it, which is in basically the essence of the Internet uh, Society objective. Okay, nice one. Uh, we <laughs> talked about um, <coughs> cybersecurity technical experts, uh, the, the issue about how, how they are selected. The current definition uh, says it includes full-time national servicemen, 18, 19 year olds. Uh, so I'm going to ask Haresh. Haresh is a Outstanding reservist, and I think he holds a pretty high rank in the reserve, right, Harish? Yeah, used to be. Used to be. So, okay, so what do you feel about this bunch of people being cybersecurity technical experts? Remember, these, were the, these are the people who are able to issue orders on the ground. I need to go in now. I need to look at the place and stuff like that. And uh, how come there's a discrimination for reservists who might be more experienced? Yeah, I'm, not sure whether, I'm not sure whether it's full-time management that is specifically stated, is it specifically stated as full-time management? Okay. Well, you know, they, they could pull in the reservists and turn them into full-time management, right? So there's nothing stopping the Enlistment Act from changing in that sense. I mean, you can mobilize. Once you mobilize, you're full-time at that point, right? So, uh, but no, I, I've already stood down my NS liabilities on that. Um, I think the question there would be, it's the same thing, you, you, you allow an 18 year old to have hold a weapon and go and shoot somebody. So we, we, we have no issues with that, it seems. 
But you can't watch a movie. Eh? Yeah, we can't watch a movie, we can't do many other things, you cannot vote, but you can certainly kill somebody else. Okay? So that's definitely acceptable from our perspective. So the same thing is not being extended to an 18 year old going into a premise because you are claimed to be a cyber security. If I'm trying to get my son to be, uh, because he's doing NFL, so I'm trying to get into a cyber security if he could, but, but that's a different story. <laughs> so, so I think that is a challenge here. That the, the, it actually goes back to the other issue of how do you certify somebody to be able to do this? Because now we're talking about getting certification. If you're not certified, you cannot do this. So it's, um, it's an 18-year-old, 19-year-old NS man you know, going, going to get certification while you're doing NS before you can do this. Is that same as get being a marksman or something, you know, go to the range before you can be a sniper? You know, it seems to be in that in that rubber, I don't know. That could be something that's been thought through. But I, I think the, the, at the end of the day, the, the bottom line here is that uh, there was one part where you mentioned about uh, the non-critical stuff, uh, about services and so on. Now, if this person, whether it's an NS man or not, or reservist or any one of us for that matter, were to write software, and coming from an open source perspective, an open source software that does everything that this needs to be done, are you going to now slap in and say, this open source software is now CII? So, but I put it on a GitHub repository, for example. Uh, it's a computer or set of computers, software itself, no? Well, the computers don't run on their own. There is software that runs it. Yes, so the so question then comes back to, if, if it is that in order for the software, to, in order for the computer to run, there is software. The software happens with open source software that does exactly what you want to do, and it comes out of a GitHub repository that's sitting outside Singapore, for example, and because this something very similar was done in China with something called uh, something socks, uh, blue socks, or something like that. It was a, a tunneling software to get out of the firewall that the Chinese government went into the, this person's home and asked him to take down the GitHub repository. So on GitHub, it says, I have been told to take this down. So the source code officially is no longer on GitHub. So that's an example of what I saw. So I'm thinking through, so as an open source person and looking at it from that perspective, am I now suddenly not able to write software that well, whatever I want to do? And because now I'm slapped with saying, this is CII software, therefore you cannot do it. It is not clear in, that, in, in this at all, but a computer doesn't run on its own. It's just a piece of metal. Is some silicon in it. The silicon needs some software. Everything is software. So if the software is essentially what we're talking about, it's not the hardware. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask my thought. That's my next question. But <laughs> I don't want to reply in response to this first. Thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. I, I, uh, uh, I have a question which is totally not related to what this, not completely related. It's a new point. Um, but it's also um, tied to what Marish just mentioned. To me, I, I just want to take a step back because um, when you did your presentation, right, and you showed the list of um, different um, industries that essential services, yeah. the essential services right. I frankly couldn't find anything in there that uh, I couldn't find. Any, I couldn't find any item in there. Um, yes. This one, yes. What What's not on that list? The only thing I couldn't find is high fashion. <laughs> right, so the, going back to what uh, Harish was saying, I think the definition of what constitutes CII is very vague. Um, if you're going to provide, uh, if you're a very small SME, if you're an SME and you provide software, uh, you only have one client, I think that was an example given, you only have one client and that client happens to be uh, the government, are you CII? So I, I find that very vague and very scary. Yeah, there you government. go. Functioning of government, then I'm screwed. Then I, then I'm, then my company that I'm running is already CII. I mean, I didn't even know that until today. So to me, uh, that's that's a scary part. Where do you draw the line? The lines can are can be very blurred as 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 per what you have been describing, and that to me is very scary. Asha, I I beg to, uh, you know. Uh, Mike is there. Yeah. 
Asha, as uh, an IT auditor for high retail, I definitely think that uh, uh, fashion is yeah, high, uh, high fashion definitely could be CII. <laughs> 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 uh, well, what more makes you think that uh, you know Orchard Road and a lot of Singapore's revenue are not part of its critical in, uh, in information infrastructure? And then it should be on the list. Then it should be on the list. <laughs> how do you how do you define that boundary? That boundary doesn't seem I think that's a very fundamental yeah. point that point. needs to be fixed first. Yeah, needs to be. Yeah. 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 There's always this um, fear that even though you might not get a CII, you might not get notified, uh, but down the line, because you are supplying something to someone who is uh, who's going to get that notification, he might not be able to tell you he got it, but he's going to start saying, "Look, I'm writing information, and, you know, for you to be able to respond this way." If I require it, uh, and then he's going to start pressuring you to, to do that. Otherwise, he has to go to someone else who can um, fulfill that, that requirement. Uh, and so that's the trickle down effect. So even though we're trying to narrow it, by the time we trickle that down, we find that pretty much everybody gets caught. And uh, that's the, the, the experience in the financial industry, right? The, only the banks are subject to uh, uh, risk management. Um, standards, but what the banks have gone is every single vendor that they have, whether you are supplying uh, computer systems or paper clips to them, uh, they say, Look, you know, if you run out of paper clips, that could be like disastrous. So, we need to have a backup plan <laughs> to make sure that we continue to supply you with. So, I see yeah. this list as a living list, it's going to be constantly changing. Uh, I don't know. I don't That's know. what it looks uh, like. There, there, remember, there are subcategories within each list. Um, so, so how that's is this going to be? I don't know how this is going to pass you know, as, a, as a living list, as something that's so flexible and changing. Yeah. Maybe if I add something just for the sake of a uh, thought process here. It probably, you know, we have seen all those multi line disclaimers in the emails that go out by you know, whoever sends email, which is, I've always felt to be useless. <laughs> Maybe there's one line that will be needed to be added. So I'm tempted to add it into my signature from now on. Essentially saying, I have not been served with a CII. <laughs> so that when I do get served with a CII, that line disappears. Yes. <laughs> so it's a canary. Yes. Can you study the OSA before you do that? Well, I mean, I'm, I, I, my, it just got edited out. You're in breach of OSA by... No, I didn't say it. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not saying I am, but I'm just saying... Mine will not appear, you're in breach. Well, yeah. well, I don't know. <laughs> oh, it was an accidental edit. Right. <laughs> Arish is giving his suggestion of what he will do. He's not giving you any advice. On cybersecurity matters. Because I'm not a lawyer either. <laughs> 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 Are you should you get a license out of this? Burn on the board of trustees. That's what Harish thinks he might do. Yeah. I just have a point with regards to the OSA. So I think one dimension that I'm not clear about is how, because CSA is the overarching uh, authority, right? But technically, all these uh, particular essential services that have been put up are very basically regulated. So they are the next layer down, right? that is actually regulators. When we go into customers that are of these regulated uh, industries, they will already say that, oh, because my regulator tell me so. And technically that actually circumvents the, oh, I am under OSA. Uh, which is why I want to know how does the OSA layer on top of these future conversations instead of me saying that, oh, my regulator expects me to do so, to, uh, I just need you to do this. So, but I understand the reason for the OSA for the catch-all situation of all the other things that cannot be under these nicely factored eleven industries. So, so, but I just want to know how does it corroborate with the current picture because I think that is the alignment uh, between oh my regulator told me so versus I'm actually under the OSA. That's a good point. I think it's another good reason to not blanket throw in the OSA and to actually find some other mechanism of security confidentiality. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think that's yeah, I think we're pretty pretty sound. We have quite a number of reasons why. Um 
the, and the international part of it as well, I think is uh, very well covered that because there's so much which is actually outside of Singapore and which may be accessible to Singapore, I think that needs to be clarified. If anybody had more clarification which we can't cover today, please email to us at the ISOC website because you may need to sit down and formulate. If you can think of it now, that's also great. Um, and one more thing was the investigation process because I know some of you here have been involved in forensics and investigation. If you have a good suggestion on how to run it, because from what's being described here, it could be a mess. If the regulator goes in, if the police goes in, if your if your big four EWC or Deloitte goes in, and everybody and the technical expert who's wearing his uh, national service uniform all turn up at the door together, who gets first dibs on the server? <laughs> <laughs> right? So eBay. <laughs> auction. Auction is so awesome. Irish would have thrown it out the window. So <laughs> Oh that'd be littering, that'd be different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, if any of you who are in that field have a suggestion on how they can be run, that also be welcome. But okay, sorry, over to you. I well hang on. <laughs> I wanted to narrow my earlier suggestion and part of your comment about the uh, telco as being a very blunt way of uh, sort of cutting network service. So, and I take your point, cutting communication or power of the entire building can have a whole lot of um, side effects. But it, it, the, the same idea applies. If there's a perceived need, it, what I'm suggesting is, is an obligation on the part of an investigator who is dealing with an emergent situation to prefer uh, suspending, to, and I know this has forensic consequences, but to, sus, to prefer suspending a device's ability to function ahead of anything that will disclose its contents without access to the user. So I proposed earlier uh, sort of telcos and accounts, account companies, but okay, so now the, the, the same power that says server number 25 on Act 42, I want to seize. Well, first up, cut its power or its network connection ahead of seizing it. So this, this solves the problem you're raising about the, the granularity of the, of the disruption. I think the investigator is the investigator not have to investigate them. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, um, so I've done forensic investigations, right? So I think what would be the natural and more practical outcome is that the first few layers of the CII labeled uh, uh, companies within the supply chain. To be clear, I'm talking about outside CII. Yeah. Because uh, this, this, this affects Singapore's ability, Singapore company's ability to provide data processing services. As the act stands, yeah. we can't meet what any reasonable customer would require of us. So it's, it's, I'm not talking about CIR, I'm talking about something that's patently not CIR. Uh, I hear you, but I wanted to add a different layer of that different dimension to the situation. Okay. Where those first few layers of the CII supply chain, right, could potentially already be expected from a high availability standpoint, such that they can switch over to other systems. Um, so that would actually minim minimize the practical impacts of actually not being able to provide essential services. For those that are outside of the territory, yes, I agree, that is a question mark. I also don't have an answer. Because actually in my bullet points that I'm collecting, the foreign aspects um, of the supply chain is actually going to be a big headache. I'm going to have stuff inside the territory. Uh, if, 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 if an investigator in the middle of dealing with an emergent situation, a, an incident in progress that's caught, that's, for example, a piece of malware attacking the power grid and determines that one of our servers is coordinating the attack. Then the last thing that we want to have happen, and, and I think it's so bad that if, if the law remains this way, it gets in the way of the, our ability to do business in Singapore is to have an investigator come in and grab the machine and, and demand access to its contents. In that situation, which is the one that, that drives the investigator moving faster than the courts, which is the power that the Act is trying to create. If, if the court's involved and there's, there's opportunity for judicial overview and an appropriate review, that's fine. We're happy with that and, and our customers are happy with that. But we're talk, I'm talking about the investigative powers for non-CI equipment, where as it stands, an investigator is free to grab any device anywhere in Singapore and to compel any person anywhere in Singapore to provide any relevant information without any apparent opportunity for digital review. Those, those are just numbers. So, so in, my, in my mind, basically, I think that's where the traffic light system comes into play. 
because if it's really that critical uh, event, any time delays about judicial review and all that, we are all totally screwed. I understand. And so yeah. what, I, what I'm saying is that it would make sense to put uh, upon the shoulders of an investigator who's acting on the powers created by the Act an obligation to do everything possible in these emergent situations to achieve what he's achieving without examining the contents of the server. Yeah. Right. I think it's basically the And that, the, and that, the, and that the, yeah. the, the, if they're dealing with an emergency, in almost all cases, it's going to be pull the network cable or pull the power cable yeah. ahead of examine the contents. And that should appear at the level of the legislation, because without that, data processes in Singapore lose the ability to tell their customers, yes, we will get this review before a, the government looks at it. Okay, so what we're saying is that to prioritize over the C, the I, and the A, the C yes. should take the priority over the I and the A, categorically. And any or agreed that with, the C with, with, just, with respect to non-CI. For not the non-CI, I'm just talking about non-CI. Some, I know for business reasons, some may prioritize the I and A above the C. And I think that comes back again to the this problem. This, this comes up in uh, yeah, EFF's driving is a bunch of others driving it, where it is a mandatory requirement that data processes will subject all attempts by law enforcement in the jurisdiction where the data is processed uh, to access that data to judicial review. Yeah, I think then, then, so. It's, so the C, the C absolutely unequivocally comes first in almost all cases with respect to data processing businesses, law enforcement access to data processing businesses. Okay, so yeah, that's that, that that data processing businesses. Yeah. Okay. Now, this doesn't actually, uh, you know, from a response scenario perspective, uh, it's just one, you know, pulling the plug or pulling the telephone cable. It's just one of uh, the options available. Now, if you already know you've got a notification that you are a CII and you want to provide availability to your customers, uh, just like... But, uh, sorry, repeating, I'm talking about the situation you're not CII. Even if you're not CII. Um, you are interested in providing availability to your customers. If one is you have uh, a particular information resource, whatever it is, whether it's infrastructure or otherwise deceased, you have backups that you could, you could you know, work out of. The other aspects to it is um, while that incident is under uh, investigation, you, if you, if uh, um, your CII elements, let's say you're, you know. You have both non-CIA and CIA components. The CIA components have what is called a honey pot or a honey net where you're gathering that information. So it's already giving you some information of the threat where it is protected from the CIA context, which you could then apply to a non-CIA. So it's not always, the scenario is not always about pulling the plug. There are many, many options of uh, incident response, incident mitigation, which can be planned. There are standards around that. Um, pulling the plug is one of the many options and judicial review, but from, from an actual preparedness perspective, there would be many, many, uh, uh, a full range of scenarios that you could actually work with as opposed to only pull the plug option and, and judicial the, 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 mechanisms around so that. So repeating the suggestion, the suggestion was only that the, the act placed upon a CSA investigator a formal obligation to use all means possible to meet the, the, the objective that is so compelling that you can't wait for judge, short of access to confidential information. In non-CI, CI is a different game. But it, it, because without that, that data process business can't function. We, we can't say to our customers, your, your data will not be looked at or covered in the industry. Yeah. I, I, I think there is a point for them pretty specific type of businesses where confidentiality is, is important and uh, maybe you can uh, Well, hang on, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's all businesses. Anyone, anyone, yeah, okay. anyone, anyone who processes this PII sure. has this specific set of obligations under the PPA. So, I mean, it's not, and yes, this, this act will override the PPA in emergent situations, which makes sense inside Singapore for organizations inside Singapore for PII, the place that people inside Singapore the same argument will not be accepted by companies and organizations outside of, of Singapore. So it's not a special case at all. It's almost not all a specific cases, specific but, cases. But it's, it's almost all the data business that Singapore is pursuing. Okay. 
Uh, we, we have to move on. <laughs> I don't, I don't we have to move on. Thank you. Okay. Um, Benjamin uh, Ang, I haven't asked you a question yet. Um, <laughs> some of this stuff is going to cost uh, a lot of money. Um, how is that going to be handled? And kind of related to get that OSA issue. Uh, if you can tell that the business all of a sudden has to spend a huge chunk of money on security, you might be redeemed and you have to re redeem your accounts. Uh, that might actually really do that you can designate the CII. Yeah. But that aside, businesses that are going to be designated are complaining that it's going to cost them money. How, how does that sort of? That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's, I think uh, we, we are definitely pretty much convinced in this room that OSA is not a good idea. So let's say that if they can actually go and openly say that we are CII, we need money, perhaps funding at a policy level, there should be more funds available to help support companies that need to ramp up greatly. And if we're talking about giant telcos and you know incumbents, then Sometimes we have less sympathy for them. More, we have more sympathy for the startup. Money, we have more sympathy for the, for the, for the, for the, for the yeah. But the incumbents say that they have so much money they need to spend, they will hit their bottom line and their shareholders who are ordinary people like us will also suffer. So anyway, some thought needs to be put into the policies for funding and for subsidies if such things are necessary. Yes. Uh, especially if small companies are going to be designated. And it's small companies. And if it goes down to the supplier level, uh, definitely, the, there are many grants that are out there, but I think more awareness and something perhaps even more targeted towards this. Okay, so let, let's move on um, to licensing. Uh, this issue about licensing cybersecurity services, uh, new thing for us in Singapore. Um, good thing or bad thing? Uh, let's hear from the hackers and the coders in the room. In general, I think it's a good thing. Licensing has got some value in it, but it becomes one of the onerous in the sense that if you didn't get licensed and you hired the person to do something, that becomes a problem, which is what you were suggesting earlier in terms of how the law is being drafted. You have a problem. And as a person hiring somebody else, how would I know, what do I know about this person? He says he's blah, blah, blah. I have to take his word for it. So is there some kind of a, a registration process that you go through, like you know, like like lawyers, like uh, doctors, you know, and engineers for that matter? Do we have now a registration process that I can check his entry in the blockchain for that particular thing and say, oh, this guy is valid, or whatever it may be? So if that is, then maybe yes. However, you know, what is? How do you keep them valid? How do you keep them current? How do I know that the person is sufficiently? trained to do whatever he claims to have been trained for, for what, whatever I do, I, I require. So I think there is some value in it, but again, this may end up becoming, what if I hire someone from outside Singapore, so that means he cannot do anything here. Now I can understand from a civil engineering point of view, you need to have be a PE in Singapore before you can certify buildings here, that's fair enough. But how about this particular day, because he's remote. He's sitting in Ukraine and trying to fix my problem for me. Or he could be world class guy sitting somewhere else. Yeah, and he yeah, not going to get certificate. Okay. And he could be being served for that matter, right? He's sitting in Mars and fixing my problem for me. But the prob the thing is, we don't have because of the porous porosity of the internet. How do you ensure something like this is valid in that sense? We are shooting ourselves in the end. Nobody does anything in Singapore, and we we, get, we, we, we you know lose the lose the, the the big picture here. I think the licensing is actually from a broad thinking perspective, the right direction. Yeah. Uh, the PE certification approach is the right thing. However, I also see the challenges because um, I've done hacking uh, as well as uh, forensic investigations, right? So there are tons of other certs out there that claim to do equivalent activities or claim to certify that the person is suitable to do X stuff, but uh, there's no one right one. So are we then going to categorically say, oh, the whole world's available certifications under this category and this activity, I accept. So that, like the scenario you said, some person overseas in Europe who has the equivalent but different cert altogether, we recognize that. So it becomes very onerous and you really need to monitor and update that listing so that the licensing makes sense. Okay. 
uh, from a licensing perspective, uh, uh, what I've, as an as a practicing cybersecurity professional and uh, one of Asia's first uh, certified ethical hackers, I find uh, that the question has, at least from an act perspective, has not been thought out deeply enough, because hacking there is a breadth of knowledge in terms of a range of certification, and there's a depth of knowledge in terms of expertise within a particular discipline. And every scenario in cybersecurity, often the basis an event, would either call for a certain element of both breadth or depth. And that kind of talent, uh, often you would want the best to breed talent in terms of the right competent person in terms of breadth and depth for that particular scenario. The other aspect about it is, uh, one is from, this is from the individual perspective, where you're looking at best person for that particular problem. The other aspect is from an organization perspective. If I am a cyber security provider and I, uh, I was uh, the head of um, uh, a cybersecurity uh, organization that works in 47 different countries. Singapore happened to be one of uh, our main headquarters, but as a proportion of the revenue, the 46 other countries would probably give 96% of the revenues. From that perspective, why would I license my cybersecurity professionals or continue to operate my best professionals in Singapore because it's too onerous. It makes the cybersecurity professional vulnerable. In similar comparative examples of, uh, like, let's give an example. There was, there is a very famous cybersecurity journalist. His name is Brian in the US. Yeah. And he, he publicly advertised his, he used to run a blog on cybersecurity. His credentials were advertised. And automatically hackers took possession of, you know, completely disabled him from the network. Now, if you're going to public, have a public forum with the identity of your cybersecurity uh, personnel advertised on a forum, uh, there would be reservation of the really talented cybersecurity individuals to make themselves a target in cyberspace. Let's say Singapore has an overt enemy, you know, for whatever reason. Like, for example, uh, the New York Times published an article uh, uh, hacktivism. They were, if they would want to attack, they would first say, let's see where the defenses are coming from. They know the, the penetration testers are on this list. These are their IDs. They, they enumerate their IPs. So you're providing through the list an easy attack surface uh, through the licensing platform for the cyber securities. It's good for people trying to hire a pen tester, but that same transparency can be used to attack Singapore's infrastructure because you, you now have a list of specific people with sometimes uh, their phone numbers, their IP addresses can be traced and other information, which uh, can compromise the very security that you're trying to protect. That's an interesting point. We should protect the uh, protect protectors. <laughs> yeah. um, one thing is that should then the licensing be a non-offense kind of category so that people with licenses are then considered to be more trusted, more trusted then and you can actually work with somebody who doesn't have a license, but you then have you target and talk by everywhere. Uh, my view of the act was that the uh, the use of that license services wasn't great, but it was the offering of them commercially, for example. Yeah, that's right. So that anybody can still offer, but those with licenses will be considered to be more so valuable, more legit, more respectable to become a, a badge to wear rather than legal requirement. This is a suggestion. What do you want to do? Voluntary um, licensing scheme. Uh, like your trust whatever thing on your website show that you're trustworthy or I think Yes, I, I think that the company registration or licensing scheme probably makes sense. Uh, it actually resonates very strongly from an individual risk perspective. So 
cyber professionals, not all are as good as protecting themselves. Uh, <laughs> they might be very good defenders, but they may not be the best defenders. And that's natural of the cyber security landscape. Right? You naturally create strong red teams, which are poor at doing blue teams. Uh, and likewise, the other side of the fence. So the personal liability can be a greater risk, and probably at the organizational level, that helps business. But personal liability, very strong. strong I, I guess the other thing about licensing was we are, we are trying to um, guard against a situation where we had somebody uh, trying to penetrate the uh, defenses of some place and you know, nobody knows why he was doing it. Uh, when they catch him, there's this phone on uh, cyber security testing and so on. And but if they're not licensed, then that's, that's, that's where they're going to get you for. Yeah, under CMCA, you already get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, does anyone know why the Act wants to create a public register? On consumer protection. How does that protect you? So that the consumer can go back to the... Oh yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so the consumer can go back to the register <coughs> and will know that the whatever certificate is being shown is a real one and not something which was photoshopped on. So the risk came with the suggestion that uh, if the uh, practicing corporations Registered the only corporations capable of offering the services important. It's such an even handed thing. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe let's take one last question. Uh, and uh, everybody else, if you need to submit questions, uh, I think we've got an email address somewhere that you can give them any or feedback. Uh, uh, sorry, Jeff, uh, last one. Um, recently, um, Recently, um, uh, my team, the red team, yeah, the red team, we did a pen test. Okay, the situation is like this. We did a pen test on a government infrastructure accidentally. Oops. Oops. Yes. Uh, was it honest or not? It's an honest mistake because of the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's not, a, it's, it's not Singapore government. So, oh, 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 so now, to come to the point of the licensing part, okay, okay, I'm a cyber security professional, I know what I'm doing, this is my certification, here you go, scan this, and you are screwed. You are screwed. Because the IPs, sometimes, when, uh, anybody in network, okay, IP slicing, if you slice wrongly, you are screwed. And who will hold the blame? Especially if you're coming from a large organization. Thank you. I've got the perfect solution. The good lawyer. <laughs> Get Brian's cut. I think you're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. I think I just want to roll up the point, right? So, from the CII perspective, now with the, the contents of the bill, right? The expectation is that you know exactly your parameters and through the technical documentation that you require. So hypothetically, the quality of the technical documentation provides the bounds, which will potentially eliminate that uh, providing the wrong information. However, I agree also that uh, from a delivery of the, from a service provider perspective of delivering the service. The human errors will happen. So then, how do we get uh, some uh, opportunity to then say, okay, yes, this is an honest mistake? I think that yeah. need to be addressed. Uh, of course, it could be an in house team which doesn't require licensing, but then because of a uh, subnet mistake, we then go back there something else. Uh, then again, a good model. Uh, Asha, I think we're going to give you the last question and then we'll close up your day. It's okay. So it's just a miscellaneous okay. comment on a kind of different thing that I don't think we touched on. 
um, taking it again at the meta level on, on the whole thing. I'm particularly concerned about the, well, some allusion has been made to it, but not in the same terms. It's, it's basically extraterritorial jurisdiction, right? Extraterritorial jurisdiction and conflict of laws, conflict of international laws. And in relation to the current situation that Singapore is in with regard to our foreign relations, do we really want to pursue a legislation that seeks to seeks or purports to have extraterritorial jurisdiction. We're coming back to the point of uh, lessons to be learned from small states. I think that the cover is not true the MOUs that are already being signed within the SCSA and other organizations internationally. So that probably is their groundwork that they're trying to do to pick it in. But we will not cover everything. I, I do believe so. Yeah. So that that is truly a point to consider as well. The only question I would have the MOUs have got no legal basis. Yeah, sorry. But they are international handshakes. I uh, just wanted to make a quick point about the uh, fee slicing and to bring up on that. It's a similar uh, sort of scenario as when you are licensed, you have to license doctors, uh, but if a doctor was to be negligent, it, it is the same, the same sort of situation, I think, unless I'm missing something. The other point I wanted to make earlier about this gentleman's point on the content, um, it's not really a very specific case. I think PII is, affects every single and I think the other issue where it comes to uh, uh, international, uh, multilateral cooperation and international situations where you have um, CII uh, uh, across boundaries, this the the issue the one of the challenges would be how this would work in conjunction with privacy laws. For example, the new GDPR coming out of Europe. That's going to be a huge challenge for even for Singaporean companies. Even though you might think, okay, uh, we're not in Europe and this is not, it doesn't concern us. It does concern many uh, Singaporean companies, large and small. So it's not just cybersecurity. It's cybersecurity um, when it comes to uh, government having a hand and saying, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to pull the plug. Uh, where do you draw the line? Um, you can pull the plug, but you don't. You should not be looking at content because you might be in breach of GDPR uh, regulatory regulations and then that's a that's a whole fish I mean that's a whole uh, Pandora's box in itself. Very good point Asha and uh, on that note about plugs uh, I have a plug to make um, <laughs> <laughs> GDPR um, with the new uh, amendments that are coming up for the PDPA there was also an announcement that was slipped in that they're gonna put Singapore on the cross-border privacy rules uh, APEC system, uh, which is going to be a subject of a consultation which the, I think the Internet Society will do. In order to find out about that, you need to join the Internet Society. We have our AGM coming up on the 25th of August. Uh, and so if you keep in touch with us, we'll, we'll keep in touch with you. Our email address, uh, as well as taking in um, um, comments that you have, uh, on this is info at ISOC, I-S-O-C. Uh, dot sg simple um, and so keep in touch with us and um, thank you for turning up and uh, I think we'll be here to take uh, some questions uh, offline after this event so once again thank you and have a good weekend.